All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Rose. I work at the Challenger Learning Center of Northwest Indiana, which is where I am right now in our uh, mission control. And I'm here today with our commander, Greg. Uh, Greg Karras, he has worked as a fourth grade teacher in Indiana for 37 years. And as soon as he retired, uh, he got a job as a flight director here at the Challenger Learning Center of Northwest Indiana. Um, a flight director is somebody who um, flies our simulated missions to space when we have them in person. And we are here to, with him today to talk about his experience with Challenger, space. He is our resident, basically know-it-all person. He knows everything. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far, but hi, Emma. How are you feeling today? I'm doing well. How are you, Greg? Great. It's great to see you, and it's great to see you there on the actual yes. live set where you do the virtual missions with the kids. We are happy to be here today and still be coming, and we can't wait to have you back in person as well. Um, so my first question is going to be pretty broad. Um, when did you first realize that you loved space? Well, when I was a little kid, I lived in East Chicago, and then in second grade, we moved to Munster, and I went to Elliott School. That was the old Elliott School before they built the new one, and I remember one day, our teacher was uh, Miss Thorne, said, we're going to go down to the basement, and we usually went down to the basement was where the cafeteria was, and it was not the right time of day for lunch, and I said, what's going on? And we went down, and we watched the one of the Mercury launches. And it may have been Alan Shepard, the first time an American went up into space. And I can remember doing that on more than one occasion, you know, being a little kid in elementary school and they would take us in the basement and then you'd, you know, hear Walter Cronkite, you'd hear the people counting down three, two, one, and you'd see this, you know, massive machine fly up into the sky. And I just thought, how do they do that? And, and um, that right there, and, you know, I was probably similar to millions of other young little American kids who watched that stuff. And then, of course, all the way up, you know, you'd see the Mercury program uh, continued in, into the Gemini program where two astronauts went up. And then when I was a uh, freshman in high school, the summer after my freshman year, they, they landed on the moon. And my interest in that, uh, it, it stayed, you know, solid just about throughout my whole childhood into my young adulthood. And then, of course, following all the things that happened subsequently with the space shuttle program. So I've, I've been fascinated by the whole thing since about the age of seven. Wow. And what makes space in general, not just space flight, but exploration, what makes it so fascinating? I can just remember, you know, being a kid and just there was always so much to learn about it. I, I tell this story to the kids all the time when they come in for a lab or a mission. I had this book and it was the little golden book of the planets. And I would sit and, you know, look through it. And, and I remember once it, it had a section about Saturn and it said Saturn has five moons. And, you know, I thought about that. Wow, we only have one moon and that's so cool. And then I grew up and was a little bit older and I was in, in junior high. I had a teacher named Mr. Jennings and he was talking one day and, you know, he's talking about the different planets. He was our science teacher. And I said, well, you know, Mr. Jennings, Saturn has uh, five moons. And he said, well, Greg, no, there are actually more than five. And I went, what? And he said, yeah. And I said, but I've got this little golden book of the planets and it says <laughs> they have five. And he said, well, since they published that book, you know, our telescopes have gotten better and we have discovered that oh, there's actually more. And then when we you know, sent the Voyager out there, they you know, discovered there are dozens of moons around uh, Saturn and Jupiter. And so I think that idea that you know, we start out knowing nothing, you look up and you see this vast, infinite, you know, starry sky, mm -hmm. and then little by little you learn, wow, those, those particular points of light, they're moving. And you know, in the ancients, they called them wanderers and they were planets. And, you know, the entire, uh, you know, the night sky, here's the North Star and here's the Big Dipper. Just there is, there just seems to be an infinite amount of things that you can learn about it. So that, that has always, you know, been really fascinating to me as I've yeah. gone along through life. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, when I started here at Challenger, I was not a kid who was like super inspired by space growing up. I knew about it. And, you know, I always had that childhood dream of mm -hmm. being an astronaut because who doesn't? Um, but I never really like actually looked into it very hard. And so then definitely when I came here to Challenger is when I started noticing that of all the infinite things that we can learn about space, because that was just 2015, 2016 that I started at Challenger. And we've still, we've already discovered more moons. We've discovered more planets. Um, oh, and you see things like they land on an asteroid and yeah. they, you know, they've uh, just, uh, you know, the amazing uh, technological advances that have happened just because of the space program. You know, we all have our little phones yep. 
I always like to tell the kids that the amount of computing power in this phone used used to have to have a gigantic room filled yeah. with these gigantic vacuum tube computing devices to do it. And they they realize, well, we're gonna have to learn to miniaturize stuff. So we've gotten so many benefits from it from it as well. That is so true. Um, there's never a thing here that I'm like, huh, that came from NASA and not just <laughs> from Earth. I love that. That that is an exciting part of the whole endeavor. Yes. Um, so that's going to bring me to my next question of um, maybe it is Mercury, maybe it's Apollo or Gemini. What is one NASA experience that you've never forgotten that is so vivid to you that you can just imagine you're there? I, I can remember specifically, and I've already mentioned it, you know, the year that they landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. I wasn't home that night. I had a friend named Rodney Clark and we were over at his house. And I remember we were in his basement and the television was on. And Rodney Clark's mom was standing there. She was ironing clothes, watching the TV. And I was there with Rodney and a couple other of our buddies and a couple of his older brothers. And they were kind of high school kids that were older than us. And they were making funny comments about, you know, well, what's taking them so long? Because when they landed on the moon, there was a long time gap between actually coming out. And, you know, when you saw Neil Armstrong descend down that ladder, and then you heard him say, oh, I'm going to step off the limb now. And then you heard him talk about, well, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I just felt like, first of all, there are hundreds of countries in the world, and that was our country. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of pride that, you know, we are the people who work together, 410,000 people working together. Some of them made the parachutes when the spacecraft is landing. Some of them made the food. Some of them made the space toilets that they had to, you know, utilize when they, when they would go up there. And it just was so fascinating to me that uh, all of it worked. And of course, you know, two years prior to that, in 1967, they had the Apollo 1 fire where three astronauts lost their lives. And so you had that um, idea hanging over your head that, well, this isn't a, a sure thing. This is a dangerous enterprise. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a 363 foot high tower filled with this fuel that's going to ignite. And if everything doesn't go right, you, you, you know, you could, you could have an explosion and things could go horribly awry but it did and it worked and, mm -hmm. and to see that. And then, you know, a couple of years later to see Apollo 13, they did have a problem when they were, yes. you know, going to the moon, but they figured out how to, how to work hard and work together and bring those people back live. And that, of course, that wonderful Tom Hanks movie where they, you know, they show that in detail, but I, I would have to say to answer your specific question that, that night, that Apollo 11, you know, when I was just a high school kid, it, it was just um, so wonderful to, to be a witness to that achievement. Yeah, and I know you're definitely not the only one who would say that. I know my own dad, he remembers that very vividly. Um, and I can I even show you something here. I just, I, I made a new suit because my old one wore out and we get to choose our patches. And I'm not sure if you can see that. Yes. I, I have an Apollo 11 patch on my uh, space suit. And of course I have my little Commander Greg thing here. And, and you know, you've got the teacher in space one over here, which I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll talk about in a little bit. But I just wanted to point out that um, that's one of the great things about Challenger. When I first came, I saw that different flight directors had different things. And I said, well, isn't that a standard thing? Don't we all have the same? Oh, no, you pick. You know, if you want to if you want to uh, focus on one particular mission, you can do that. And uh, that's just an, another thing I thought was fun. Yeah, I have an Apollo patch that I will be putting on my own flight suit when I start doing in-person missions eventually. Um, but yes, and hopefully, as I was about to say, hopefully with all of the new space flight stuff, we get that same excitement back. Because um, I know I've watched all the SpaceX launches so far, and I always remember that it's not a sure thing. And, you know, a lot of people kind of take it for granted. They look at it and they're just like, okay, you and, know. And, and, you know, you mentioned SpaceX, one of our former flight directors, Commander Jeannie, her son worked for them and she would have some inside information. Do you remember I do Jeannie remember. Us, yeah. yeah. And she had some great stories, you know, and, and his job when he worked for them was just to make the device that helped the rocket stay safe as they were transporting it to the pad. But every job is important. Yeah. Every single little aspect of it has to work and come together. So oh, um, absolutely. It, it's great to see that cooperation <laughs> has to take place all across the board. Yes. Um, so I'm going to ask what we're now we're going to talk about Challenger a little bit. What drew you to Challenger? Well, it's a funny thing. I was a fourth grade teacher and the fifth grade students at our school would come to Challenger for a yearly field trip. And 
I was never in the facility. I, you know, would hear fifth grade kids, hey, Mr. K, we went to challenge today. It was really cool. We flew a mission. We found a comet or whatever it was that they did. And I thought, oh, that, that's pretty neat. And um, the year I retired, I worked at a summer camp that they had at Valparaiso University. My teaching partner, Lisa Thomas, told me, hey, they have a thing where, um, you know, they're doing these summer camp activities. They're looking for people. How about your rockets? Because when I was in the um, summer school program in Valpo schools for about 17 years, I taught this class called rocket science. Mm -hmm. And the kids would come in and we would build these Estes model rockets, you know, and uh, teach the kids how the engine goes in the bottom and there's the parachute inside with the recovery wadding. And she said, I think they'd really like that. So for actually, I think I worked there three summers. Um, I signed up and worked. It was called Summer Smart, Summer Fun. And while I was there, there was a professor named Bruce Hrivnak and his son and my uh, son went to school together. And he sent me an email and he said, hey, uh, you might be interested. This um, Challenger Learning Center has an opening for a flight director. And I, I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> and so I, I emailed the people and it was Becky Manis was in charge at that time. And they called me in for an interview and uh, I was very nervous. I hadn't had a job interview. You know, I was a teacher for 37 years, but it had been a long time. So I, you know, I just uh, went in there and, and fumbled my way through the interview, but I, I guess I fooled them. And so that was about seven years ago now. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get the position and it, it's a hundred times cooler than I even thought it would be mm -hmm. just from imagining what that, what that job would be like. Yeah. And that's so funny. Cause I feel like we all have a funny story of how we got hired here. Cause that was like right before, I think it was three months before I came here, um, to work. Cause I'm going on about seven years, uh, in like next You're year. A veteran. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I also, you were a kid that came to challenger too, right? I was yes. And then when I was in college, um, I knew there was an opening at challenger and I was like, well, I, you know, doing what, like, am I going to be on those missions? Like I, I vaguely, or I, uh, very specifically remember it, but I like, what else do they do there? And so I came in as well and kind of fumbled through because I was just, you know, I had just dropped my resume off and they were like, come back in. And well, pe people really need to know that you've been a huge asset to our organization because you. <laughs> you work so hard. I just, I wanted to tell people about the night we went up to the um, Navy Pier and we did that yes. Adler Planetarium, uh, the, the, the job together with them. You brought so much stuff for I did. people to be, I mean, but it was that just a testament. You never, whether it's one of these fundraisers that, you know, that you're working on now, you never go halfway. You always go way over 100%. To. So it, we really appreciate it. You're one of the reasons why it's so much fun to work here. Oh, thank you. That's all right. It's well Star Wars. So I have to bring up Star Wars. Um, some people who are watching this may know that you and I did um, Star Wars camps for quite a few years. Um, I was Emma Kin Skywalker and it was Commander Obi-Wan Greg Obi. Um, and so what about Star Wars specifically do you find interesting? I just, you know, I think, I can't remember the exact age I was. I think it was a young teacher when the first Star Wars movies came out. And just to see that world, to see the way George Lucas imagined that, you know, and, and I, I sometimes talk to kids and I say, well, you know, Star Wars, that's a movie set in the future, right? And they go, yeah, it's in the future because they have spaceships. And, you know, if you listen to the very first line, it's long, you know, long ago in a galaxy far away. And then that makes you think just that whole idea of not being, alone, you know, of we're not here, maybe in the cosmos, all by ourselves there's yeah. something else out there and that could have been a civilization that happened a long long time ago that idea fascinated me and just the beauty with which they carry it out you know the humor with the droids and how yes. they interact and just you know luke skywalker i know you've always mentioned how he's kind of a whiny character at the beginning and he grows into this jedi knight and he you know acquires this zen-like confidence and all these abilities yeah. it's just a it's just a fascinating world and of course the new rendition with this Mandalorian. I don't know how many people have seen that, but it's just so beautifully done. And uh, I, I just find the whole world, it, it's just a, a, a fun place to be in and to yeah, think. Yeah, and so I know we teach a lot of science <coughs> and a lot about space through Star Wars. And I wanted to know when, cause you were, were pretty much our originator for this lab uh, back in 2015, maybe. I don't re even remember. Um, so how, how did you come up with that? How was it fun, easy to teach about space and science through Star Wars and science fiction? Because I remember we had mentioned other science fiction things during those first few camps. 
Um, well, we, you know, we were thinking about um, different aspects. The um, the hologram, you know, when uh, Princess mm -hmm. Leia is got the little message beaming out of R two D two, and you actually came up with a little device that became this little triangular pyramid of plexiglass that you can shoot up through your uh, top of your cell phone yes. and you can make an image that looks like that. So we did that. I've got one of our lightsabers. I we yes. talked about before. Uh, we teach the kids how you can, I don't know if the lighting is working on this, but we can, good. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can turn this on and we teach them how to sand down a plastic tube and mm -hmm. how the light gets diffused when you do that. And you paint it the certain color that is your, you know, your color of choice. And you can bring science ideas in. I was always fascinated. I'm not a huge Star Trek fan, but I was was fascinated when I heard Bill Gates talking once. He was saying that when he saw, you know, Spock and Kirk interacting on that show, and they would say computer, and he would say yep. computer, and then you know he goes in and he comes up with Microsoft yeah. and all the stuff that you know that company has done. I just find that fascinating that science fiction can be the thing that inspires real life science. Yes. And so I thought that was a, a kind of a fun part of that. And when you show kids real things with the lightsabers and, you know, I'm a, I, as you might know, and um, some of the videos we put in, I'm a big Lego fan and I have, you know, the Millennium Falcon downstairs and a bunch of other little Lego projects that go with that, just to kind of inspire kids to, to look at that and think, hey, I can, I could build that model too. And I could, you know, be involved in that world in the same way. It's been really yeah. fun. Yeah, I definitely agree. That's been a, a big part of it. And why we keep doing it for me is, is because it's just so fun to be like, hey, look, this, this could be real and has become real due to all of the creativity and imagination. Uh, I do like Star Trek and there's so much stuff that people will attribute their inventions to Star Trek or Star Wars. So yeah, that is definitely... Um, been very fun and, and so I think it's it's important to point out you know people read Jules Verne books mm -hmm. a long time ago and they would be like wow you know he, this guy is imagining this stuff and you have to be inspired at some point I wasn't Einstein said something about imagination is more important than uh, knowledge or, you know just to get people's minds going in the right direction yeah and uh, so that's something to me that makes Challenger very different but to you uh, what makes Challenger Learning Center different than other learning centers, other museums, that kind of thing. You know, the thing to me, I was a teacher, like I said, for 37 years, and you, we would take the kids to Connor Prairie, and they would, you know, have a pioneer experience a little bit, and you would go, um, you know, to the Museum of Science and Industry, and they would, you know, pull the lever, or something would come on, or they'd watch a movie, but at Challenger, they're totally immersed in the mission they are responsible for its success or failure you know oh, well, this kid here she's the communications officer and that person there they're the navigation person and if she doesn't you know put the right data into the machine the the project won't work right and you see kids invariably at the end walking out the door saying wow that was the greatest field trip i've ever been on and i think it's because they're not just looking and just you know um touching things in a, in a happenstance manner, they're doing things that if they don't do them right, the stuff's not gonna work. And so mm -hmm. I, I find that part of it to be the most engaging and time after, and that's what's been so difficult during this pandemic, yeah. missing that, you know, that look on those faces of the fifth and sixth grade kids as they're walking out and hearing them talk about, wow, we found a comet today, or, you know, wow, we landed on the moon or whatever it was that they accomplished. Yeah, we've been doing virtual missions. I, I feel like you may have mentioned that. And you're right. It's definitely, you know, it's it's great and it's fun and it's great to see these kids working and, and you know, doing all the steps, but we don't get to see them afterwards and seeing them leave and hearing them chatter and talk about what right. they liked and everything. It, it's and, that human interaction that makes it such a special place. Yeah. And in addition to that, and, and I don't know how much people are familiar with, we have the missions, but then we have these special labs. Mm -hmm. There's a simple machine lab and there's, you know, um, living in space lab. And in the, in the simple machine lab, I always try to show the kids I have this, uh, I had this huge foot surgery a few years ago where there are five giant screws that are, you know, gone through my foot for this triple arthrodesis. And I will tell them, this is science in action. Mm -hmm. My foot works now because Dr. Brian Tulin at the University of Chicago put these five screws in my foot. I couldn't walk before he did this. And my wife, you know, she's a survivor of uterine cancer. She had robotic surgery. Dr. Diane Yamada, also from the University of Chicago, she operated on her from 17 feet away from her body. She was running the robotic stuff. And my wife was all the way across mm -hmm. the room. 
and they went in and they removed the cancer from her and you know and she's been alive these last yeah. six years because of that and so i try to tell kids science is wonderful it it saves lives it does yeah. this this terrific stuff and you know we're seeing that now with the uh, initiation of the vaccine program get people vaccinated and you know we'll we'll return on the path to health for the mm -hmm. nation and the world yes so I'm going to go back to talking about the, the previous Challenger tragedy that happened in 1986. But before that, there was the teacher in space program. Um, before we talk about your experience with teacher in space, I want to know uh, what inspired you originally to become a teacher? You know, when I was a fourth grade kid, my teacher, I went to Elliott School, as I mentioned, my teacher was named Mrs. Sue Yerkes, and she was a wonderful teacher. And we had a huge class. I think we had 39 or 40 kids in our class. And I was way in the back of the room in this, you know, giant classroom in, in Elliott School. And um, one day the door opened and this gentleman walked in. He was about six foot seven. And he came back, he took a folding chair and he sat right next to me, way in the back. I was in the back row. And we had the kind of desk you could look inside and see, you know, what was inside the desk. My desk was a mess, papers, crayons, you know, just in there. And he, he leans over to me and he whispers, hey, your desk is a mess. And I went, yeah, but you know what? There's about 40 kids. The teacher never comes back here. I think she's pregnant or something. So she's probably too tired. I got it made. And he went, oh, and he kind of like nodded his head. The next day he came back, she had gone on her pregnancy leave. He was our teacher. Oh no. The first thing he did was he walked back to my desk this is the honest truth. He picked it up almost to the ceiling, flipped it over, and all the stuff came cascading out on the floor. And he said, I'm not pregnant. I'll be back. <laughs> oh, Clean yeah. it up. And I looked at that man. His name was Mr. Donald Ketcher. And he was my teacher for the rest of that year. And I was fortunate enough I had him again in fifth grade. And I've been in contact with him since. And, um, you know, that moment, I, I knew when he picked up my desk and he looked at me, I that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be an elementary teacher. So that was a real powerful moment in my life. It was really that fun too. That is too funny. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that you can go tip kids' desks over pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wasn't as dramatic in that area as he was, but he, he, he got my attention. Let's say that. That is so cool. Uh, so then we're going to talk about teacher in space. So back um, in the 1980s, Challenger was the missions going on around then. Um, can you kind of explain to us what the teacher in space program was? So President Reagan was president at the time, and they were going to do this thing where they thought that space travel was becoming more and more safe. And so, you know, you don't have to have this rigorous training that they had had for all the years, you know, going back to the early 60s. We should be able to just take a, a regular citizen up. And so they came up with this idea of teacher in space. And I actually, I have my original application for that program oh right here. And it was a pretty extensive thing. Now you have to remember, these came out during the time, no computers. I did this on a typewriter. So, you know, you type in all your information and there was a whole, so you, had, you had recommendations from your principal and, you know, maybe some parents. And there was a whole series of about 11 questions where they asked you, you know, describe your communication skills. And then you'd have to type up this big giant thing. <laughs> I believe my communication skills, blah, 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 blah. And I worked so diligently on this thing for months and sent it in. And, you know, waited to see whether or not I would go to the next phase. And um, I was fortunate enough, I, I received a letter and I even have that. And it, it told me that I was one of the 26 semifinalists for the state of Indiana. And so I was really excited about that. And then they said, and the next a round will be if you're chosen for the 10 finalists for the state and then there'll be 10 national finalists and I waited with anticipation you know I was a, a young uh, dad at that time my kids were little and I got the letter and I, I didn't make it oh. said, you know you have not advanced to the round of 10 for Indiana and so I you know of course was crushed and then later they said but would you like to come and watch the launch and so they they sent me this information for um an educator's launch conference. And I didn't have the money to go, but my school PTA and the principal got together and they they helped me financially. So I was able to go. So I went down to NASA. We toured the vehicle assembly building. We heard different engineers talk. And I, I will never forget, there was one engineer and he, I think he's still alive. 
he may have passed away, his name was Lee Solid. He worked on the, uh, the three main engines of the space shuttle. And we were in this big, huge auditorium and he, he could look out the window and he could see um, you know, the, the space shuttle sitting on the launch pad. And he said, uh, let me get this straight. All of you people signed up to go up on that thing? And we said, yeah, yes, sir, yes, we did. And he goes, well, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and we said, well, it would be, you know, such a great adventure. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what. He goes, I've been working on those things since John Glenn went up on them back in the early 60s. And he said, I won't climb on one of those things for all the tea in China. <laughs> and we went, why not? And he goes, mark my words. One of these days, one of those things is going to blow up and it's going to look just like Roman candles on the 4th of July. Ugh. He said that that week before oh, yeah. the accident took place. I wrote it down. I've never forgotten that he said that. He said, those things are not operational. He said, the airplanes that brought you down here to Florida, those are operational. They have millions of hours of flying time and they know how those things are gonna react. Now, once in a while, one of them will crash. He goes, those things, they are so experimental. And he goes, you have no idea the, the kinds of things that can take place. Well, he was an insider and he knew mm -hmm. they had the delays. I don't know, did you, were you able to see that Netflix series? About I was, the, yeah. Yeah, and you notice how there was more than one delay. Yes. Well, our conference ran out of time and they sent us, you know, I, I had to go back home. So I was not there when the actual tragedy took place. I was in my classroom. I think I was given a, a spelling, you know, pretest and the kindergarten teacher came up and she said, did you see? And I went, no, no, what? She goes, they're all dead. And well, I went, what? She said, the space shuttle blew up. The astronauts, they're, they're, they died. I, I you know, turned on the TV in my classroom and saw the replay of it. And that moment, you know, talk about powerful moments when you're yeah. reflecting. And, and, you know, this Kristen McAuliffe, she was such an inspiring figure, the person that they actually chose. Mm -hmm. And her backup, Barbara Morgan, was um, you know, uh, an elementary teacher like I was myself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize or, a really great thing. She stayed with NASA mm -hmm. and she actually flew a mission in the, in the 2000s. I mean, she it was around for years and years. And that's a really inspiring part of that story. She didn't do it as a teacher in space. She was yeah. a regular astronaut by that time. But um, that was the kind of uh, impact that that had. And, and then to see, you know, um, how they came up with the idea of the Challenger Center to honor the memory of those people. We're not just going to have a, a plaque somewhere or a statue somewhere. We're going to have a living, breathing institution where kids can come and learn about space. I, I just, I, I think it's really neat that, you know, June uh, Scobie Rogers came up with that idea um, and, and they followed through and did it. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I definitely, I watched the NASA or um, the Netflix documentary about the Challenger and, and going back to the comment about them, the space shuttles being so uh, experimental, they talked a lot about how they were like, there were miles and miles of wiring and we weren't even sure exactly where it went to. Like, Oh, it's amazing. The book, I read the book, the Alan McDonald, the one Morton Thiokol engineer, he wrote this big, huge, you know, 500 page book. It's called Truth, Lies and O-Rings. And he mm -hmm. talks in depth about, you know, we had blow by when the cold temperatures were taking place and we knew that this was going to be a problem. And when they told me they wanted me to sign off, he said, I'm not going to sign off on that. And, it, you know, you just see in detail how that whole thing unfolded. And, and it's sad because just like a lot of, you know, other situations that could have been avoidable, yep. I, you know, they could have, they could have taken steps for, so that, you know, for that not to happen. Yeah. And it happened again later with, you know, Columbia. when the Columbia, mm -hmm. you know, in the early 2000s exploded. So yeah, we always have to learn. You know, yep. we always have to learn from those events that take place. Yeah, and that's why we're here every day, still. You know, teaching their story and and keeping them, um, keeping Krista's lessons alive. And right. stuff. I know you you have Krista's original. I, I have I have them right here, and that was a really bittersweet thing. You know, this was her idea, and it was called Teacher in Space: Your Invitation from Space. Come aboard for history making educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. And you know, she's got this big detailed all these things that she was going to do and of course it never took place because of the tragedy mm -hmm. that happened but you you just um you know it it just causes you to really reflect on how careful we need to be mm -hmm. in these uh you know potentially very dangerous situations yeah but aside from you know challenger and the the disaster in 1986 if you could have become an astronaut outside of that, would you have done it? You know, 
I, I think it was, that's kind of like asking if I could be the quarterback for the Super Bowl team, would I have done it? I always felt like those people, you know, their either their technical abilities were so far beyond what mine would be. I, I, you know, teaching was my wheelhouse. I can mm-hmm. be in a room with nine and 10 year old kids and relate to them pretty well. I didn't really think I had all of the you know, attributes that you need to be an astronaut. I wasn't a pilot. I wasn't somebody that actually could have done those things. It was more like hero worship for me. Like, wow, those people, mm-hmm. they're up here on a pedestal. So I, I, you know, when, of course, when the opportunity presented itself, oh, we're gonna have a private citizen go up in the space. That was fine because you then just, you're just a passenger on the space shuttle. Yeah. yeah there's going to be seven people sitting there, but the guys who really know what's going on, they're going to be driving the ship. So we're that, very that's humble, kind of, Greg. That, well, I, I mean, I, I would- trying to be honest yeah but if you could go to space you know i know spacex is launching their first uh commercialized space program very soon um with those i think four men um that they're sending up soon uh but if you could go to space where would you go oh like if i could pick a destination yeah if you could just go wow. anywhere. <laughs> okay so this is this will sound kind of odd but i one of the things you know we're talking about all these different moons one of the um uh, moons of believe of Saturn is Enceladus and Ooh. if you ever saw pictures of it maybe the viewers can look it up there are cryo volcanoes shooting out of the south pole of Enceladus and when the Voyager went by they took movies of it Ooh. and so if you could go and fly there and see it's these ice crystals that come out of the bottom of the moon shooting in this volcanic fashion I would love to go see that. Yeah. Oh, it would take years just to get there because Saturn is so distant. But I, I just, um, that just seems like a really cool place to me. I don't blame you. I, I have very random places that I would choose as well. Um, Where would you go? I don't know the names of these places because it's been so long since I watched the Planetarium show about them. Um, but there's a sun that I know it's like always spinning basically like really fast and the light only comes from like the top and bottom it's in our stars show so of course i should know it by heart um and then there's also like a planet or like a moon that is made of like fully of diamonds so like the whole surface is diamonds um amazing because of the pressure so those are the two two of the places that i would and and that goes back to what yeah we were discussing before just the endless amount you know when you find out that well, we're one galaxy that has billions of stars and there could be billions of galaxies. I, it's just, it's, it boggles your mind, you know, yeah. the, the, the distance is involved and just the possibilities that are out there. Yeah, it's very hard very to much. fully put that into uh, perspective. So um, I have a couple more questions, I believe. Sure thing. What is your favorite part of teaching children and youth and even grown-ups and adults about STEM, space, history, all the stuff you bring to Challenger and talk about? Well, I think if you can point out things maybe that they haven't considered before, you mm-hmm. know, maybe that they haven't thought of before. My favorite uh, moment in the seven years I've been at Challenger, I remember this one young girl, I think she was a fifth grader, you know, they were getting ready to go. We're in the briefing room after the mission and um, she as they get up to leave, you know, the teacher's walking out the door and she looked at me right in the eye and she said, I just want to tell you something. And I went, yes. And she said, you inspired me today. Aww. And I was like, well, that's probably the nicest thing anybody said to you the whole time I've worked here. And that idea, you know, um, one of the kids, he was a former student of mine, his name is Adam Studebaker. And I, you know, he was a fifth grade kid the year after he was in my class. He used to be on our brochure because yes. when he was a fifth grader, I believe he was the navigation officer on his mission. Now he works for the Raytheon Missile Corporation. Oh my God. And he's got his advanced degree. He's worked on these human powered submarine competitions. He's a brilliant kid. And he, he credits Challenger, his experience coming here as a fifth grader for setting him on the path yeah. uh, that he, he was on life. And he always loved science. When he was a middle school kid, he invited me to his bar mitzvah and every table in the restaurant had a different science project, you know, on the table. And it was just a, a beautiful thing because his parents encouraged his, you know, his interest in science. So I would say if you can get somebody excited, somebody to say, yes, I'm going to be an astronaut because of what I learned today, or I want to become an electrical engineer, or, you know, mm-hmm. this little girl who said, you know, you inspired me today. And she, you know, I don't know where she is now 
she's probably, you know, I mean, that was years ago. So she's, you know, maybe in high school preparing mm -hmm. to go to college. Who knows what she's going to major in? Who knows what her life's going to turn out to be? Mm -hmm. But that kind of thing. And that's always been that way for me as a teacher to see somebody who says, wow, when you read that book to us, you know, it really opened up my mind or it really did this. I, yeah. that, that, that's the great part of teaching. Yeah. And I mentioned that you bring so much knowledge about space, STEM, and not just, you know, science in general, but history, uh, pop culture. How do you retain all of that knowledge? I think all of us here <laughs> want to know. Well, I don't know if I retain it. I just, it's <laughs> present in my mind. I, I, you know, have always been kind of fascinated. I love to read things. And since I've worked here, I've read a lot more things about space, you know, the Apollo 8 book and the Apollo 13 book. I mentioned that the truth lies in O-rings and the Neil Armstrong biography. I just think if you have an interest in stuff, it's easy to remember it just because, you know, you think about it a lot. Yeah, that I, I can definitely see that. <laughs> and you just it's, like it's, a lot of things. <laughs> it's, it's fun. And it's, you know, it's better than, and, and I'm not saying I don't have times when I just sit and blob out and watch TV too, but <laughs> it's nice to have a balance between, you know, your blobbing out times and the times when you're yeah. actively using your mind to make little know. projects or do different things. We always know to come to you when we're like, I don't, I don't know the exact thing, but let's ask Greg. He'll know. Yeah. And, and hopefully sometimes I will know, but not always. <laughs> and you mentioned Legos earlier. Um, as so many kids know about your Legos, because we have them here and we're always like, oh, those are Commander Greg's, those are Commander Greg's. So, so many people know about it. And you were telling us your love of Legos is to show, you know, kids, people, everyone that you can do that kind of stuff and it is still STEM because you're engineering, you're building. Um, and so how do you think that Legos do affect? Cause we use Legos here all the time, you know? Um, I, I think, you know, for instance, like right here on my little desk, I've got Mae Jemison, the first African-American female astronaut. And she's mm -hmm. next to Sally Ride, the first, you know, American female astronaut. I just think that you can use little things like this to teach and to inspire, oh, where are they standing in front of? They're standing in front of the model of the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. This is Margaret Hamilton. I always try to, you know, point out the fact she was the person who designed the computer software for the Apollo missions. Mm -hmm. Without her computer software, that spaceship doesn't fly. She's from Indiana. Yeah. And so we always tell the kids, hey, look at that girl. She's from Indiana. She was a really great math student. She loved computers. She figured out how to, you know, write the software. This is um, the last one I'll show. Nancy Roman. She was the, the project uh, head for this Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. And I always like to tell uh, kids that, that, that thing she said about engineers and scientists. Engineers want to know, you know, how something works. Scientists want to know why. And mm -hmm. she said we needed both kinds of people to build the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Legos... You know, and I, it was funny because I had the Star Wars ones out on my table and I had just taken down the Christmas ones a couple of weeks ago and I've got a whole Lord of the Rings set of them somewhere. Yep. And, you know, you guys have the rocket ones there and, you know, the Saturn V and the, and the, and the Lem. I'll be honest, it's just fun. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to put them together. It's fun to show them to kids. There are some kids who have such a strong affinity. They'll come in and they'll see the little space setups and they'll go, wow, you guys have that here. I wanted to get that one. My mom told me I couldn't get it because it's too expensive. <laughs> and I said, well, work hard, make your own money. You may, maybe you'll have a chance to get it. But um, yeah, there, I, I just find it, it, it's, it's a really fun, kind of a fascinating hobby to pursue. Do you have any latest projects, new projects? I know you're always coming up, making something new or- I'm, um, you know, I just ordered, I know you're a big fan of the Mandalorian. I didn't order the whole Razor Crest spaceship. I just ordered the little set that's got the little, you know, baby Yoda, Grogu yes. guy, and, and of course the Mandalorian. <laughs> and that's, that's a relatively inexpensive one. That'll be the next one I build, but I always have something coming down the road to kind of enhance yes. each little world. I, I ask you to keep sharing those with me all the time. Um, I, I am happy to do that. And I'm happy when sure. I'm honored when you guys choose to display them at the Challenger. Yes. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is your poetry. Um, you know, some people already know because we have that we share our, your poetry on our social media at Challenger itself that you write beautiful, wonderful space poetry and science poetry that, uh, and not just that, you also do, you know, holidays, Christmas, Halloween, but um, we always share the space and the science ones. What inspires you to write that poetry? Like, what just, how do you, how do you do that? You, you know, and I have to give credit to my sister. Um, she's, I've done three books this year and my sister illustrated two of them. Here's the Halloween book. I love that one. Uh, poetry has, 
I mean, it's just something that I don't want to say it comes to me easily, but it's not hard. If somebody mm -hmm. says, hey, I need you to write a poem about Frankenstein or something, I can usually do it without too much difficulty. And so I think, well, if you've been blessed with the capability, you should utilize it because, you know, that's that's why it was given to you. So, um, you know, at the school I taught that we do uh, this yearly reading project. It was called Friday Night Live and we do songs and poems. And I was fortunate to be the person who could write those into little skits that we did. So it's always been something that I've, that I've uh, been involved with and it's always been something that's fun. And I, I have to you know, mention going to school in Munster. I had a wonderful education growing up in Munster. We had terrific art teachers. We had terrific literature teachers and coaches all the way through. So I, I think it's, um, you know, it's wise to pay tribute to those people who inspired you along uh, along the way. Yeah, and it, all of the poetry that you send us, I always am blown away and just like, how? How do you even? <laughs> well, thank you. you. That's this up? That, that's very nice of you. And I guess today the final thing I'm going to do is read a little poem. Yes. So uh, to close us out and finish up, um, we're going to have you read one of your favorite space poems, one of my favorite space poems from the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission. Um, so if you want to talk about it first or anything, or just want to go right into it. Well, I knew that, you know, it was coming up. I talked about being a high school kid when they, when they went to the moon and uh, when the 50 year anniversary was coming up, I thought, well, I, you know, should in some way pay tribute to that. So I came up with this and I, I just have to tell people, you did these beautiful illustrations you put in the, <laughs> you know, the Saturn V rocket taking off and the pictures of the, the astronauts going. So this is called 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. should I just go ahead and read it? Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. 50 years ago, I'll tell you, this was how it was. We turned on our TV screens and saw Michael, Neil, and Buzz. The tower which they sat within rose high into the sky. Longer than a football field, folks gazed and said, oh my. So then they fired the engines up. They took off towards the moon. It only took a few days. Yes, they got there very soon. Then Buzz and Neil made their way into the landing ship. It's called the Lem. Mike stayed behind, wished them well on their trip. Buzz and Neil descended while fuel was running short, but Neil found a smooth site. There was no need to abort. He set the craft right down there. It was called Tranquility Base, and everywhere upon this earth, a smile crossed each face. Neil climbed down the ladder, then he spoke that famous line, and Buzz came out to join him. Oh, the things they saw were fine. They filled up their containers with some moon dust and some rocks, and the folks back down on earth reminded them about the clocks. They both climbed back into the ship and lifted off from there. The things which they achieved that day are all beyond compare. They rendezvoused with Michael, those three headed back to earth. Then the whole entire planet felt an awe-inspiring mirth. As that ship splashed in the ocean and the carrier fetched those men, we stopped and all gave thanks that they were back at home again. Yes, that's the way it happened. That's the way the whole thing was. I'm glad I was around then to watch Michael, Neil, and Buzz. Yay. Thank you. That's an honor that. to be able to read that to our people. And I just wanted to, can I thank the people for participating in your fundraising endeavors sure, that yes. you're doing? Yes, because it, it's, um, Challenger's an important place. Mm -hmm. We're blessed to have this facility. We're the only one now in the state of Indiana. It's, it's a, a terrific thing. Maybe you went there as a child. Maybe you know your kids have gone or your grandkids. And so uh, from the bottom of our heart, we'd like to thank you for, for doing that. And thank you for putting this all together. Of course. And thank you for making the time to join me and, and talk about all of this and talk about yourself. It's uh, we been love an you honor. Here, Greg, and we, we can't wait to have you back and be flying those missions again and be seeing those kids and inspiring them once again, hopefully soon. So. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I thank you very much. And thank you. And Laura and Val and everybody there that's keeping the ship going even even through this difficult time. It's a terrific thing. Of course. All right. Okay. So I will let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you, Commander Greg. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll see you soon. Bye, Greg. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>